I realized that um, when Matt Booth preached, um, one of the things he did was to, and it's something that's become a familiar pattern within this preaching, is to throw up an image of, of something that will give you that warm and fluffy feeling inside. And um, in Matt's case, he showed his robotic vacuum cleaner. <laughs> and in my case, I would like to share with you our beloved paper shredder known as Fellows. Now, honestly, um, with seven-page cross-cut, it really doesn't get any better than this, okay? Um, some of you will remember that um, on one occasion when my wife Alison was away, and I said this in a previous uh, message, that um, I was trying to prise some chewed up paper out of the paper shredder and it was diverted into my hand. What I realized is that fellows actually flinched whilst I was trying to do that and therefore I've had to make a decision. So we've decided that we had to put fellows to sleep. <laughs> Collective? Ah. Oh. So we now have a newly acquired paper shredder and this is, as they say, the bee's knees. As an example, you can see examples here of um, toilet paper. Obviously, this is recently acquired. If this was at the height of the pandemic, probably we would be bankrupt looking at the price of toilet paper during that period of time. And also, um, this particular paper shredder also seems to be able to completely um, destroy insoles in short order. And so we've had to put our slippers on the top of the chest of drawers. This, yes. So I'm actually afraid to say this to my mother. Oh, this is going to be on YouTube. Okay. So she sent me this copy of my birth certificate. And within short order again, this was ripped to shreds. I put you out of misery. This is our paper shredder. It's Sydney. <laughs> But we love our pets, don't we? We love them. Regardless of what they have done, um, there's always going to be discipline. Alison has been taking um, Sydney to agility classes. And despite the discipline, there is that love. We've made a commitment and we've made a decision. And it's very much the same in terms of God's love for us, that he's made a decision. And that decision he's made from eternity past. And nothing can change that decision, regardless of the mischief and the mistakes we make. We all know that there is a God who loves us and actually wants to bring us close to himself and give us that experience of his love. As we think about that, we should be able to look into some of the situations that Jesus faced when he was walking the face of this earth. And one particular situation I'll start to talk about which is to do with this, this Jesus story. One of the things that we've noticed about all the Jesus stories so far is that there are some common themes coming out. For instance, when Tim Champman preached, um, he spoke about the lost son, he spoke about the lost coin and the lost sheep. That sense that something was missing and that somehow God, in the way he described it, wants to reach out and retrieve What's missing? I certainly know that that's been my experience of God, and I would commend that experience to you as well. And one of the things that's a, complete, a continuous theme within those stories is crisis. There's always a crisis, whether it's the widow who has lost a coin and thinks that she can't actually pay for food over the course of the week, or it might be the shepherd who is caring for a hundred sheep and then realizes that one of those sheep is missing and leaves the 99 behind and goes and retrieves the one that's lost. Or the lost son who decides that he wants to have independence from his family. He takes half of the family inheritance. He goes away to foreign land. He squanders the wealth. He falls on hard times and then realizes that he's suffering so badly. And many of us have gone through that experience of feeling that we've been away from God, that we've stepped away from the protection and the care of God. 
And yet God is so willing, as in the case of the lost son, to retrieve us. But there's always a crisis moment. And maybe that's something, as much as we speak with joy about being retrieved by God, there are those who will hear this. There are those who might be even here for the first time, for whom life right now is crisis. And one of the things about crisis is it reveals a person's true character. It reveals who they really are. And that's why Jesus used these stories, to bring out what the true character really was. Maybe the question I would ask you is, how do you react in crisis? Example would be a disciplinary crisis. I've gone through them in my career. I have lost my job many years ago for incompetence. And it's a reality that brings upon you a sense of loss, a sense of, of frustration. And in the story that we're going to go through, this is what this particular individual, known as the shrewd manager, is going through. And because of it, it speaks to us if we are going through a crisis. So this parable of the shrewd manager is found in Luke chapter 16. We need to get a little bit of background about this before we can go into the real content and the focus of, of that message. But one of the first things we need to understand is the kind of manager that was in this particular story. So what was this manager's job? The central part of his job was to negotiate a proportion of each farmer's produce, which was harvest, and it's strange, because the language I use here, I do use big words. And I, I, I said to my wife um, yesterday, I was trying to go through the parable, and I said, in exchange for growing crops. And she said, I don't understand that. So I kind of went through it again. And she said, oh, you mean rent? And I was kind of humbled. I thought, yeah, that, 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 that's, that's exactly what I meant. So I'm going to use that word. He's collecting rent, but he negotiates the amount of rent and he can work out how much margin he wants to add on for himself because the person who owns this land, the estate owner, is absent anyway. So in that situation, it could be 50%, it could be 20%, but he negotiates his own margin. Now this is the tough part. This is a part that shows that regardless of how much you've studied the Bible, you can always learn something from somebody else. Because I would skip to Jesus' moral to the story, and as you see here, it's a little bit of a long, probably a very long sentence, where Jesus says, I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourself, so that when it's gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Everybody's sort of scratching their head. And I was scratching my head as well. I mean, what, are we, what is he trying to explain through this? And is it how to win friends and influence heaven? Through money? Kind of doesn't work. So I took the view, mm, I think he's kind of being what we call in England tongue-in-cheek. He's trying to be a little bit sarcastic. Yes, be my guest. Go and win friends through money, and heaven's going to open its doors to you. Then I was on a call with Sam James, <laughs> and Sam James is part of, and I've spoken to him about this, so he's okay with me sharing this. He was on a one-to-one -one call on Teams with me, and we were going through this, and so I gave him my view that this was the sarcastic expression, and then he literally snapped my belief, my belief on this, in a, like a twig. I mean, this is like one of those YouTube videos where, you know, it's a Sam James crushes David Shepherd. <laughs> you know, normally that expression, you know, t contorted expression is part of, of how the video gets sold. But that's where it was with it, because he said, but he was speaking to his disciples, so why would he be sarcastic with them? Yeah, I, I thought about that as well, and I kind of nodded my head and then realized how embarrassing it was for me. So we need to do some scene setting. This particular scene, if any of you have watched the series called The Chosen, 
It's a very popular series, and it's about the life of Jesus. And in this particular scene, we have Jesus healing somebody who's paralyzed. But this person is not only paralyzed physically, Jesus, with all the power of God, realizes that he is also paralyzed in terms of conscience and guilt. And it comes out in what Jesus says. You see that there are two men peering through the window. And those two men belong to a religious group known as the Pharisees. In our own language, we say the separated ones, because they believed that we needed to be, to be strict and very much about what we'd call presentation and in PR terms, what we call optics. It's got to look right, it's got to look right, it's got to, it's got to work. And in this particular scene, they're not really willing to go into that space, but they're peering on. And they're trying to work out whether Jesus is actually going to keep with the law of God. Whether he's going to do the prescribed things that need to be done for this man to find acceptance with God. You have to do your rituals. You have to do your sacrifices. And Jesus cuts through all that because he's announcing a new era. And he says, friend, your sins are forgiven. You can imagine the horror on their faces as he completely goes against the grain of everything that they had been told so far about how you get accepted by God. Eventually, Jesus builds this reputation of reaching out to people, and this is what will happen to our church, of reaching out to people who most people think are unreachable. This was what they said about Jesus. This is a man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Imagine that. And for those of you who want to kind of get a little bit of insight into what we mean by sinner, those whose immoral lives have shown complete disregard for God. I want to give you just one example of that type of person. And the only way I can do this is by way of an analogy, by way of, of, of something that has happened in, let's say, the 20th century that we can relate to. Imagine the unimaginable, that instead of the Allies winning the war, the Allies lost the war to Nazi Germany. And Nazis are now occupying Britain. They need to set up a UK headquarters of the Gestapo and the SS. And some of our British citizens decide that one way they're going to be able to make some money out of this is to collaborate. And so they decide that they are going to give, they're going to fund the Gestapo, who are so brutal, in return for the police and for the authorities given the right to be able to take that, to extract that out of British citizens like themselves. I mean, what treachery, what betrayal. Yet if you go back to the first century and you look at the Romans, they were as brutal as anything the Nazi regime did. And these tax collectors did exactly that. And Jesus was known as the friend of tax collectors. So the parable of the shrewd manager then plays into this because Jesus is trying to help the Pharisees who are so strict in their religion, to understand what's causing the tax collectors and sinners to flock to him. And so we read through the scripture. Jesus also said to his disciples, there was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. So he called him in and asked him, what is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management because you cannot be manager any longer. Now this isn't sort of, we're going to call you in for a disciplinary, we need to do an investigation, we need to get to the facts of this. He's out of a job. That's it. Game over. Right? And worse still, he's going to have to open up his books and he's going to have to show 
how much margin he's been extracting out of these farmers and how much is actually still going through. It will go through at harvest time to the rich man. Imagine what that feels like in that moment when you've, you're, I'm on a disciplinary. That's what's going through his mind. And what's the manager's immediate reaction? Well, this is a picture of Peter Lorre, who is this kind of um, perplexed villain who is very much a part of, um, of, of the film era that was before I was alive. <laughs> the manager said to himself, it says here, what shall I do now? He's, he's in desperation. He realizes he's being brought to book and he's under no illusions that he's a wonderful, upstanding, good person. I think about times in my past when, and I've said this to other people, when I eventually ran aground financially, a 20,000 pounds in debt, and I did not know what to do. You do really, really strange things. You start to look at things that are even statutory and legal obligations, and you start to think, how am I going to pay this? How am I going to pay my road tax? And you start to really think about whether you can do the right thing in every situation. That's what crisis does to people. And he says this. He says, my master is taking away my job, and he looks at his options, but he doesn't have any options left. And that's what happens when people are confronted with the reality that God is a God of justice and that there is a day of judgment and there is only one way of escape which we'll come to. He says, I'm not strong enough to dig and I'm ashamed to beg. In other words, I can't go from white collar to blue collar. Look at my hand, there are not, no calluses there. I'm not strong enough. I can't keep up with the pace of work. And I'm ashamed to beg. I'm not going cap in hand to anyone. They will just have a laughing stock at my expense. Panic. Panic. Some people think, well, does that fit in with, you know, Christianity? There's a great song we sing, isn't it? Um, Amazing Grace. Twas grace that taught my heart to fear. And thanks be to God, even in my situation, t'was grace, my fears relieved. Next thing we see is a pivot. Now, some of you, I don't know if you're friends, fans, but a pivot in, um, I don't know if you remember the episode in which um, Ross wanted to save on the delivery fee for a sofa, and so he ends up trying to haul it up a winding staircase, and he's screaming down to Chandler Bing, pivot, pivot, pivot. And of course, Chandler says, shut up, shut up, shut up. <laughs> and, but it's the same thing. It, it, it's a change of direction and approach. He has his light bulb moment. And listen to what he says. He says, I know what I'll do so that when I lose my job here, people will welcome me into their houses. Remember what he says, people will welcome me into their houses. So what does he do? Listen to this. He says, so he called in each one of his master's debtors. He asked the first, how much do you owe my master? 900 gallons of, of olive oil, he replied. The manager told him, take your bill, sit down quickly and make it 450. He's wiping out his 50% profit margin. He realizes he's been brought to book and he is going to start doing some serious restitution. He's going to do some real paying back now because he needs these people to be on his side. Then he asked the second man, how much do you owe? A thousand bushels of wheat, he replied. He told him, take your bill and make it 800. 200 bushels of wheat. In today's money, we're talking about 2,000 in commission in olive oil and 3,900 in commission in wheat. He just wipes it out because he knows. Game's up. It's all over. May as well. He was practicing reconciliation through 
restitution, giving back. That's what he was doing. And the rich man's response. The master commended the dishonest manager because he acted shrewdly. For the sons of this age are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind, in other words, between themselves, than are the sons of light. They understand. Men of the world, women of the world understand when the game is up. If it's a criminal case, you know what? I'm going to cop a plea. May as well cop a plea. Hands up. Right? What's the phrase? Bang to rights. Bang to rights. And R is for recovery. Because he now knew that those people who he had swindled and cheated would now be able to look after him. In other words, his turnaround was what we call repentance through restitution, through giving back what he had taken. In other words, and I'll read this to you, when found out and the game's up, non-spiritual people are quicker to reconcile with others by giving back dishonest profit than the proud pillars of society like the Pharisees. They'll even sacrifice what was gained by greed for the opportunity to escape what they deserve. And that is why corrupt people, like tax collectors, like John Newton, amazing grace, how sweet the sound, that saved a wretch like me. He knew the game was up. They flocked to Jesus. And unfortunately, the pillars of society didn't. That's why. And the reason why the pillars of society is they still felt on the balance of things, although he's talking about judgment, I'm a good person, kind of, ish, mostly. So Jesus is moral to the story. What does it really mean now? If we say it like this, look, I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Mm -hmm. Change. Let's say it like this. I tell you, use worldly wealth in restitution, giving back, to gain friends for yourself. In other words, to reconcile with people that you have injured, hurt, denied, so that when it is gone, he doesn't say people will welcome you. This isn't an exchange. This isn't you doing something for them, and then they do something back for you. He's saying this is a principle of the kingdom of God of God. You will be welcomed. The right response to God's willingness to forgive, that is his grace, involves reconciling with those we've wronged through giving back whatever we've selfishly gained or withheld. And that's what real repentance looked like. I had to pay the 20,000 back. I mean, it's great to say, yes, God forgive me, God forgive me, but I had to pay it back. And thank God, he gave me the means to do that. And there are people who will be drowning. And I want to reach out at this point and say, we have a debt advice service called Frontline. And the pastors are willing to direct you to that service so that you can get the help that you need. Zacchaeus is a perfect example of this. Zacchaeus was a tax collector, but after that conversation with Jesus, he said, half of my goods I give to the poor, and I will return four times what I have stolen. Does it apply to today's world? I mean, you know, is this just something that's back then? This is taken from the HMRC research. This is one person who says, when I do my private hairdressing, that either goes into my personal bank account, or I use it basically towards holidays and stuff. I'm not trying to judge anybody for this, but this is stuff that happens. Restitution means you're going to start paying the VAT. Toilet rolls, coffee, those sorts of things will go through together when I do the weekly shop for the business, and I'll take a couple home. But you've bought it for the business. It can't really be for personal use. So this is Jesus' final moral to the story. He says, whoever can be trusted with very little, 
These kinds of worldly things, they're here today and they're gone tomorrow, can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So if you haven't been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, I mean the stuff that's here today and gone tomorrow, who will trust you with the riches that last forever? The kingdom of God. And if you haven't been trustworthy with someone else's property, in other words, you've been a little bit light-fingered or you haven't paid what you owe, who will give you property that's yours forever, property of your own? No one can serve two masters. This is the kicker, isn't it? No one can serve two masters. Either you'll hate one and love the other or you will be devoted to one and despise the other. I had to make a decision. I had to work out that there was something more important to me than dodging the people to whom I owed that 20k. You cannot serve God and money. I had to work that out. And it's a struggle, but we all have to work it out. So we suddenly realize that in these stories there is crisis, there is pivot, and there's recovery, that Jesus is doing CPR. Not cardiopulmonary resuscitation, but crisis, pivot, and recovery. The danger, as Drew pointed to, Drew Booth, as he preached about this, is that of the rich man who had just contempt. He left things too late, procrastination, and he ended up in ruin. So the question is, what shall I do? What shall I do? Who have I treated or taken from unfairly? I need to, to work with that and I need to know that. What have I unfairly taken or withheld? I needed to come to terms with the fact that I had unfairly held on to 20,000 I'd overspent and I needed to pay it back. And then finally, do I need help with my next steps to start making restitution? I probably did need a debt recovery plan. Do I need to apologize to people who I've taken things from unfairly? And that's not just money. It could be that I've taken credit for stuff that they themselves have done. Have I withheld love and care that I should have shown? And most importantly, and I need everybody to hear this, how do I experience the assurance of forgiveness. I think that the communion is a perfect opportunity to be assured that Jesus, to square his willingness to forgive us with his justice, was willing to go to the limit of sacrificing himself on my behalf and every single person that's in here. And as the band comes back, I'd like us to think about the words that we are going to sing. And as we participate in communion and think about our dependence on Jesus for that sacrifice, let's be reassured. Let's not walk away from here with a sense that this can't be fixed. Let's not walk away from here with a sense that I'm all alone on this. We're in this together. We're all in this together. 20K, he pulled me out, fixed me. I'm not letting anybody who feels that their financial challenges or whatever they're in is going to stop them because Jesus has fixed me. You're like a circle that floats around me Keeping me safe and sound And when I fall, you've tied a rope to me You're blessing me every day